And now our final guest this evening, Margaret Lockwood. Glad you arrived. I was getting a bit wetted about half an hour ago. <laughs> You're still on the stage of the Birmingham Rep, though. That's right. With the makeup of an 84-year-old uh, queen. Well, with uh, two performances today, I've had uh, six wig changes and 12 costume changes. Mm. And um, I really am a bit exhausted. Well, I bet actually. you are. Yes, it's been a heavy day for you. Yeah. But did you see that piece in one of the papers, either yesterday or the day before, about? how this play may not get a West End run. I mean, I, I, I know that it is getting a West End run, but it was suggested that it, because some managers may be afraid that it would offend the royal family. Yes, I know. Uh, I mean, is there anything in it that could offend the royal family? I don't think so, no. It's just that um, I suppose you see a side of Queen Alexandra that nobody's ever written about or shown before. Queen Alexandra was married to Edward VII, of That's course. That's right, yes. yes. Victoria's mother. Yes. And, um... Victoria's what, did you say? Uh, <laughs> Victoria's, Victoria's son. Is that what Bertie. I said? Bertie. Yes, Bertie. <laughs> <laughs> Got me all muddled up for a moment. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, no, it's a fascinating part to play. And um, the thing is that, uh, the thing I find really fascinating about it is that I happen to be going <laughs> slightly deaf in my left ear. And Queen Alexandra was going deaf too and towards the end of her life of course she was very deaf and every time I say uh, what did you say what did you say that this is what I'm starting to do in real life myself yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, so it looks authentic if anybody's on this side of me I say it's no good you've got to come around the other side if they're whispering you know off stage I can't hear them in that ear they have to come around this side but this isn't the first time that uh, it's been suggested uh, that something you've been involved with could offend the royal family because back in 1946 <laughs> yes you're going back to the, the wicked yes, lady yes, the film yes. of the wicked lady was <laughs> yes. chosen as the royal command performance was that the first command performance? no it, no it wasn't no 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 it wasn't yeah. chosen as the command performance it was just happened to have a royal premiere a royal premiere which was queen it? mary was attending i see <clears throat> but, but the press suggested at the time the press, that it may offend the queen the and press they, came out that morning the morning of the premiere the press came out with enormous headlines saying bawdy, salacious, disgusting, appalling, Queen Mary should not have to sit through this film, she should not attend this premiere. Sounds like my kind of movie. <laughs> well, you know, when you think of it now, it's absolutely absurd. Anyway... But didn't um, they actually sent someone? Yes, there's somebody who came from um, St. James's Palace or wherever it was, and he had to sit through this film because of the notices in the morning, you see, to see whether it was all right, and of course he didn't understand what all this nonsense was about. He said, perfectly all right. It's not going to offend Her Majesty at all. And uh, anyway, uh, that night arrived, you know, we were all a bit sort of like this, and um, she was absolutely charming. We were all introduced. Uh, and then she went and sat down in the front of the um, dress circle, surrounded by these beautiful flowers and everything, and the picture started. And there were reporters waiting everywhere for the Queen to get up and go. This is what they were hoping for, you see. And of course nothing happened and the end of the film came and she rose and we all rose and as she passed me, she stopped. And I went into a curtsy, you see, and um, she told me how much she'd enjoyed the film, what a lovely picture it was, all so exciting. And I said, thank you, ma'am. And uh, she went and one of the reporters rushed up to me and said, uh, what did you say, what did you say? I said, she said she loved the film and she thought it was lovely and that was it. And he didn't print it the next day because I looked in his column and all he said was certain passage of dialogue had been muted so that the Queen would not hear it. It's absolute nonsense. <laughs> Hadn't been muted at all. <laughs> Let, well, let's listen. We have a scene from The Wicked Lady and I think we ought to take a look at it now. I remember seeing it as this high. But this is a part where James Mason, who's a high woman, has been taken off to the gallows. But unexpectedly, he turns up and has his wicked way with you. Well, what a question to ask an old friend just back from the grave. What do you think I want? 
You think it was me who betrayed you, but it wasn't it. Don't come, it... that isn't worthy of you. You always had the courage of your iniquity. What are you going to do? Ah. What would you do to someone who'd sold you to the hangman? You don't know what it feels like to be strangled, do you? My lady, it's an experience we ought to share. You feel the rope crushing your windpipe, choking the life out of you. The whole world goes black with spots of vivid color flashing against the awful darkness. You feel as if your head's gonna burst. You kick and struggle and squirm. <coughs> it's quite an experience to have had and survived. You know, after my friends had cut me down, it took them two hours to bring me round. And I had a hell of a sore throat. How did you find me? Easy, once I'd seen you in your coach with the skeleton arms. I laughed when I learned that the lady of the manor was a certain Lady Barbara. But the secret passage? I searched the grounds. Once I'd found the entrance, I knew it'd lead to you. And now that you've found me? We're going to pick up our life together just where we left off. What do you mean? I meant to kill you at first. Then I began to remember those crisp, clear nights when we rode together. The thrill of the hours that followed when you put aside your trappings of the road and lay in my arms. Warm, yielding, lovely. I knew then that it wasn't vengeance that I wanted. It was you. No! No! Have I suddenly become so distasteful? Things are different now. I'm in love, deeply, sincerely in love. Well, my caresses would be repulsive. I told you, I'm in love. <laughs> It'll be a new experience to take you against your will. You wouldn't. You underrate me. I'll call for help. And give yourself away? No, Barbara. You're as much in my power as if we were on a desert island. <gasps> no! No, please, please! This must be what they mean when they say revenge is sweet. It's all good stuff, isn't it? Disgusting. Wait till oh, the watch committee sees that. Me. What a sensation it caused in its day. But it caused an even bigger sensation in America, didn't it? I mean, they went oh, to yes. remarkable lengths. Oh, yes. There. They were terribly disturbed about the cleavage. And uh, Pat Rock and I <laughs> had to go back into the Gainsborough studios and reshoot quite a lot of scenes with bits of lace stuffed down our bosoms. I mean, that's absolutely <laughs> absurd. I mean, this was clearly in that, that, that period of the American cinema where they had the morality thing and you, you oh, couldn't kiss well, for longer than so many seconds and yes. you had to keep yes, your mouth but this, closed. This, this really was a bit absurd because, I mean, you know, we, we saw that clip. I mean, how much cleavage did you notice in that? Did anybody notice any cleavage in that? Did it bother anybody? <laughs> I thought it was quite interesting. <laughs> did you... I mean, did you come from a liberal background, or did you come from a strict Victorian oh, very, background? Very, very strict, very strict, very strict Victorian background, very moral upbringing. So you'd be something of an innocent in the cinema world? Oh, yes. And uh, did you find that the, the people did try to corrupt you when you went in there? Oh, yes, I had quite a few fellows chasing me here, there and everywhere around the <laughs> studios, but um, they never got anywhere. <laughs> None of them. And um, also, you know, the other thing in my life, there have been a great many disappointed gentlemen along the way because I'm a teetotaler. And so many people took me out to dinner and tried to ply me with um, different kinds of wine and uh, drink and things, and they never got anywhere that way either. So. I wasn't actually going to ask you that. <laughs> can, you can you remember uh, your first screen test? Yes, my very first screen test was just after I'd, I'd left the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. And um, I was just 17, and uh, they sent me down to Elstree. And in those days, all the, the, the great lighting men were German. They'd all come over from Germany. And I can't remember his name now, but I had very, very thick eyebrows, really thick eyebrows. And they didn't come into fashion until Elizabeth Taylor became a great star. Because in those days, everybody just had a penciled line. That was all, just one penciled line. Pretty much like Queen Elizabeth I had, actually. And uh, this fellow took one look at those eyebrows, and I was there with my agent. And um, he said, we can't photograph this girl. She said, those eyebrows have got to come off. And I said, what? And he said, yes, got to get them off. I turned to Herbie, and I said, Herbie, they can't take my eyebrows off. 
And he said, well, dear, it's very important, you know, it's your first test, they've got to come off. And they couldn't pluck them, it would have taken them 24 hours to pluck all those hairs out. <laughs> so he got out this terrible razor and all that lather, whatever you call it, you know, and um, proceeded. And I shall never forget the horror of looking in that mirror and seeing myself with one bare side and one bushy side. <laughs> I was absolutely horror-stricken. And I was meeting my mother that night at Victoria Station. We were going to see a play together. And I thought, I've got to ring her up and warn her, because if she sees me with these two penciled lines, she'll fall flat on her face. <laughs> so I had to ring her up and tell her that they'd done this terrible thing to me. And the really awful thing is, you see, that, that they've never grown properly again, ever. They just never have. Don't ask me why. I would have I thought they'd become more pushy, you know. No, no, not with me. Now, you went off to Hollywood at one point, didn't you? <laughs> yes. Well, what did I say? <laughs> well, uh, well, it was the wrong time to go to Hollywood, let's face it, to begin with. It was 1939. And, I mean, we knew things were getting pretty desperate, but the American papers really knew that the war was going to come any, you know, very, very shortly. <clears throat> and I was in a terrible state because um, I thought I was going to get stuck out there, you see. I thought I was never going to see this country again. And so I was, I was pretty miserable while I was there. But that, that was the reason, not because I didn't like Hollywood or the people there or anything, but that was the main reason. Well, was it, was it your choice to go? No, no, no. Um, the people I was working for, Gainsborough Studios, the studios, was, uh, they were run by a marvellous man called Ted Black. And he sent for me one day and they had a, um, a kind of reciprocal arrangement with 20th Century Fox. And he said, we're going to send you over to do a film for 20th Century Fox. And I thought, oh, Don Amici, Tyrone Power. Oh, which of them is it going to be? Because I, you know, I, I saw every movie that was ever made. And he said to me, Shirley Temple. And I said, oh, no, I don't believe it, Shirley Temple. And that was what I went to do. Uh, well, then I stayed on and I made another film with uh, Dougie Fairbanks. And, but, you know, it was really getting desperation time because I didn't get back till the end of June. But you got back in time for the war? Yes, I got back. Do you ever see any of the people that you worked with in those old Gainsborough days now? I mean, I know that you've seen Stuart Granger recently because I saw you I was you on, on his This Is, this is your, your Life, life the yes. other night, yes. What about James Mason that we saw on that scene? Well, uh, yes, uh, I can't remember what the occasion was. It was um, sometime last year. Uh, there were some awards being given and they asked me to present um, him with some special award for his contribution to the cinema and uh, it was lovely seeing him again you know and it came as a total surprise to him and I walked on stage and I presented it and the tears came into his eyes he was very moved and then we all had dinner afterwards and he was sitting beside me and he's mellowed so much you know he's such a dear man and um, he was going on and waxing quite lyrical about the wicked lady, you know, and how wonderful it all was and how lovely it all was. And I said, you've got a very short memory. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, don't you remember what you thought about it all? And he said, no, no. I said, you thought it was a load of old codswallop. <laughs> Never stop saying terrible, terrible lines of dialogue, all this is rubbish and all that is rubbish. And he'd forgotten it all, you see. He thought it all wonderful. With the passing of the years. Yeah. Well, Margaret, I, I, I'm glad the play is, delighted to hear the play is going to London, and, and I wish you the best of luck in the West End, and thank you for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Margaret Lockwood. That's all for this week. We'll be back next Saturday. I do hope you'll join us soon. Have a nice weekend, and for all of us here, good night. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
You may be interested to know that Margaret Lockwood stars along with Rex Harrison in tomorrow's film matinee at 1.55 in the afternoon. It's another in BBC One's season of classic British war films, Night Train to Munich.